So we've taken the binnacle off and this is what we find inside. It's what can only be described as a hodgepodge of cabling. You're not videoing me, are you? Yeah. Oh, go away. We've received a number of inquiries about our autopilot and what it is and how we fitted it. So in this video we're going to discuss that. The autopilot we purchased for this boat was a Raymarine Evo 1000 autopilot. Now it's one that fits directly onto the wheel of the boat and um, rather than one which goes down below decks with a steering ram and a position sensor and all that sort of thing. Um, so that it is extremely easy to fit this. It also came as a package. We did not have to buy extra bits. We did not have to buy everything separately. It came with the control unit, which does all the working out and steering. It came with the control head, which lets you change the settings. It came with the electronic compass, and it came with the actuator that runs the steering wheel. And it all came in one big box. And we should, in theory, have been able to fit it in one day, but in practice, the weather didn't play ball with us. So what we're going to do in this video is I'm going to take you through how we got all the bits together and fitted them. Um, and then going to discuss the drawbacks of this particular system and um, things like that. And tell you basically how we've used it and, and, and how it's been good for us. One of the drawbacks of this particular type of autopilot is that it's only good up to a certain size. Um, now, I think this particular one goes up to about a 40 foot boat. We're 37 ish. Um, so this particular one works with us. If you wanted a bigger one, then you have to go down below decks and you have to install um, a hydraulic ram and a sensor. And our down below decks area in the transom, while it's big and roomy, it would be awkward to fit that because we already have things installed down there and they would all have to be moved. And it's, it's a world of pain. It's also um, a more expensive solution. The other thing about this particular solution is that it is what we call a stupid autopilot. Um, it's got no brains to it. If you set a course on the chart plotter and things like that, the autopilot won't pay any attention to that. You basically give it a heading and it steers that heading. If there's um, a large rock or an island, say like Ireland, in your way, it doesn't matter. The boat will just ply into it if you let it. Um, this autopilot is good for holding a course. Um, that's what it does. So you do have to be on the ball. You, if you have waypoints where you need to change course, you need to be up here pushing the buttons to make it change course. We knew all that when we bought it, so it didn't come as a surprise. Um, more sophisticated autopilots where you can actually put a series of waypoints in and have it steer a course, they're massively expensive and we had neither the time nor the inclination nor the money to bother with them. So we didn't put one of those in. We just went for the simplest, easiest to fit, most cost-effective autopilot we could get our hands on. And it was this one. Um, the other advantage of this particular one, as far as we're concerned, is that it gives us the chance to put in a NEMEA 2000 network into the boat. Um, it's not really anything to do with an autopilot. You could fit this without having that network, but we decided it would be a good opportunity to put the network in at this particular point in time. It was going to be a lot of work, so why not just do the whole lot in one go and get it over with? So you will see that in the video where we've also upgraded the boat's network and put all the other instruments, including the masthead, which are ST1, uh, very old instruments, and our other instruments down below, such as our Garmin, and now, these days, our AIS. So what I'm going to do now is take you on a little tour of the bits and bobs that we have got in the um, on the binnacle, um, the autopilot, and how they work. Now, I can't demonstrate too much because we're in port, but you'll get the idea. So this is our Raymarine P70 control head, and it is the bit which allows us to talk to the autopilot computer down below in the, um, underneath the binnacle. And it just simply allows us to set a course, basically left or right of our current course. So quite frankly, if I want to make a big course change, I generally do it by hand. If I want to make a small course change, like 10 or 20 degrees, to starboard. Then I push the button and the wheel just goes over and does its thing. Um, I find that making large course changes with this isn't really the best things. I'm best doing it myself manually, getting to where I want to be, saying the autopilot, hold this course or make a small adjustment to it. And that works well. I can then go down below, make a cup of tea, do whatever I want to do. 
um, come back up again and the boat's still going the same way. But like I say, she's a silly autopilot. <laughs> if there's a large big rock or a boat in front of me, she'll take me straight through it because she has got no idea of where she is in the world. She's just holding a course. So Gaynor, it's Ray Marine Autopilot Day. Oh, at last. But um, Bev and I have just found a great space to be able to put the brains of the autopilot system in. Um, we're also going to be able to put the, uh, I know it's a flux compass, but me and Bev call it the flux capacitor. <laughs> uh, but um, we've got enough room for that as well. And, um, you know, it's just a case of um, putting it in this great space that we're going to use. So if you have the two cabin Bavaria variant, I'm in, lying down in the rear cabin at the minute and there's this foot well that comes down and the bottom panel comes off it and it butts up against the transom which is in here with the uh, rudder stock and the Eberspacker and other various bits and bobs but this space here is quite enormous actually. Um, it's got the rudder cables, it's got various leads, some of which have got some rather flaky looking bits of electric which will be attended to later today. Um, but you can see the cable run up there, you can see it going past the uh, the rudder wires and the rudder posts, but look at the space, I've got more than a hand's width, I cannot get my hand from the cable to there. So these can be mounted up here, the flux compass, flux capacitor, can be mounted here and will face forward and all the network components and network wiring can be mounted here and this is a beautifully dry space and um, once this uh, baseboard is put back on then this area is totally protected from people kicking it so you don't have to worry. Um, yeah so this is where we're going to put all the brains for our autopilot. And today through the round window <laughs> I can see half of a Marae Marine wheel pilot and the reason we've got it in half and you may also notice if you're more astute that the wheel is missing on the binnacle um, well you can't hardly see it but never mind <laughs> is that we are trying to figure out where to put this um, these things are developed for pedestals um, God knows why but they are so trying to fit it means that it goes sort of like that or like that where it interferes with the chain or somewhere around here and it's very difficult to try and figure out where this thing fits. So as one of our very kind viewers said we're the Blue Peter channel so with a result we have come up with a Blue Peter solution. <laughs> the Definitely Blue Peter solution but am I? In best sailor tradition Things do two jobs, so the Raymarine box that the thing came in is now doing another job, and that is it now fits Ray! on the wheel. And now we can see where we can. And now we can see where the hole, this bit, yeah. should go. Inside here we've got all sorts of things. We've got control cables and things like that on here. We've got electrical cables down here. We've got a big chain thing in here, and the only place we don't have anything. It's down this side, so that looks like the spot. I know, and look what we have. Oh, uh, go on, put it there. Yeah, that's going to be the slot, and it's not even going to be remotely no, straight. No, and this is the edge of the chain for the steering chain, which runs off this. It runs down this point here, roughly inside. Yeah, so that's about where we're going to have to cut. That's roughly where we're going to have to cut it as close as we dare to this like so yeah and um, this is only approximate of course of course but you know we'll have to come up with a better one and um, to get to get our measurements exactly right but this is where it's going to go and then this beastie will go like that and slide in there and then all the connections will be inside the vinegar yeah so but everything is never straightforward is it Beth? not on a boat not on a boat no the people who make plastic boxes for boats, for instrument pods and things like that, want to charge about £300 for an instrument pod. Well, we're slightly meaner than that. We've gone and brought a weatherproof IP65 electrical box, 
which I have um, attacked with a, a saw and the Raymarine control head now fits perfectly inside that box. Yeah, the reason um, we're not putting it in the binnacle is we're hoping to have our um, chart plotter there. But chart God, plotter there. But God knows what will go wrong when we install that one. Anyway, <laughs> this IP65 box will be fitted like this and the cables will run directly into the binnacle well above this engine. And the whole thing, because it's our Raymarine kit with our Raymarine sensors and other things will all fit together, yeah. hopefully. Hopefully. And we will have uh, an autopilot and Numea 2000 backbone or CTOC all running this together and feeding into the chart plotter multifunction display. That is the plan. But like I say, it never quite goes according to plan. But never mind, we'll try our best. Yep, and if Scanstra is watching this, um, 300 quid for a twin instrument box is not on when your competitors make the same thing for 36 quid. So I would encourage you all to go to NASA Marine and buy their twin instrument box for 36 quid. It takes a few minutes with a hole saw just to just make Raymarine instruments fit, but it is perfect otherwise. Well, this is our uh, latest item in our shopping. <laughs> Yeah. Which is going to go on there, on there, and that's going to be and pods. And it's almost a fit, it's a millimetre out. <laughs> <laughs> Which is always the way. Yeah. So Bev's going to get the uh, multi-tool out, aren't you Bev? I've got Lilu out. Lilu, multi-tool, multi-tool. <laughs> yep, that's looking grand, are you? So we've taken the binnacle off and this is what we find inside. It's what can only be described as a hodgepodge of cabling. Um, there were some other things, um, such as uh, rotten edges to the binnacle and things like that. There's been damage to the fiberglass, so that will all need to be repaired. It was clear that some of the wiring connections were going to need an upgrade. While I have been wiring in here, now this absolute mess um, is what I call the lash up. Uh, so I've tested all the wires um, that I need to test. So as you can see, what I've got here is I've got the inclinometer attached to my template. And all I've got to do is line it up. Oh, look at that. And there. So that is now straight. Well, it was. <laughs> While Skander was working below deck, I put a hub into the binnacle. So down here you can see where we're installing the Ray Marine hub. This is the terminating block. The P70 will go in here. The classic instruments, ST1, CTOC1 will go in there. And the chart plotter will go in there. And then that will go down to the hub down below decks. Soon it was all taking shape with the legacy instruments in their new box and the P70 installed on the side of the binnacle. This is a uh, particular um, bracket that's supposed to go on um, pedestal. pedestal, isn't it, Bev? Ours, it's as flat as a yeah, so we could buy the correct bracket at 70 quid. 80. Oh, 80. Or. We could use this cut with a sleeve over the top. Yeah. Which uh, is half a mil too narrow, but we can cope with that, we think. Yeah. So uh, this is a Bevan Isle solution to uh, spending 80 quid to get the right bracket. Most of which you have to cut off and throw away anyway. Yeah. So anyway, so Bev is now going to do the horrendous thing called drill a hole in salty lass. Right, okay. I'm on my mark. Yeah, you, you've been in. I wanted to show you the modifications we've had to do, but Bev's covered it, but we've had to put a bit of plastic on at an angle, just so that um, it fits inside the binnacle correctly. Okay, so basically this is it here, and we've put this bolt, and we've put a black sleeve on the outside of it to make it the right diameter, um, and I think that should do the job. She hopes. So we got the... Um the wheel pilot on and we got our thing to hold the slot in place and it's all good it all does what it's meant to do 
However, we have hit on a slight snag. That snag is caused by this angled instrument panel here. When we engage the lock, it hits on that. And as you can see, it leaves a score. And that clearly is not satisfactory. So it looks like we're going to have to put a new instrument panel in, in which all these raised sections are removed and the instrument panel is flush. <sighs> we had got the um, panel, Mev's just done a beautiful peb panel, but the problem is um, when we've got the cable on here, um, the cable that comes from it uh, snags on the chain. So for, yet for another... Gear. Yeah, to the steering gear. So, so yet another electric nightmare. So what we're hoping to do is move the cable. And that's what Bev's doing just now. Now, Beverly and I replaced um, the bumpy uh, panel that you get with um, a Bavaria with um, this um, flat panel that you see here but um, we asked somebody else who'd fitted um, the autopilot what how he had fitted it because the handle butts against the um, the bumpy panel and what he'd done is he'd actually taken an angle grinder to the handle and cut it down i must admit i think uh, even knowing that i'd have been reluctant to do angle grinder with your brand new autopilot on day one but it's just another solution okay so we've had the autopilot for about a year now and on the whole we've been very satisfied with it it has not really caused us any difficulty there has only been two or three times where, for some reason, it has lost its compass calibration and we've had to recalibrate it. Now, that is not a big deal. Generally, what you do is turn the engine on and you go round in circles two or three times while running the automatic calibration routines and bang, that's it, it's sorted out. In the short term, generally what happens is we just miss steer. We tell it that we're going that way at 330 degrees, but we're not. We're actually going that way at 300, but it seems to work with it and we're all right. So well, we just had to recalibrate it two or three times while I've been out, but other than that, it hasn't really caused us any bother. In terms of power requirements, which is another question we've had, um, it depends very much how your boat is set up. If it's working hard in a heavy sea, it will draw a fair amount of power. Um, on a day like this, where you've got the sails fairly well balanced and the boat is more or less steering itself, the autopilot does very, very little other than provide occasional corrections. And... Because it's doing so little, it probably draws very, very little power. We've certainly never had it drain the batteries or come close to doing so. So, and we have the solar panels on the back. So even if it was drawing a huge amount of power, they'd be replenishing it as quick as it's drawing it out. Um, the unit is rated at a maximum draw, a maximum draw of seven amps. But I think it would have to be really, really working hard to draw that. All autopilots, both in aircraft that have flown and other boats and things like that, if it's really rough conditions, you tend to disengage them and hand steer in any case. Autopilots in really rough conditions aren't good. So we tend to use these, this autopilot, on days where it's moderate to nice weather and we just want the boat to sit nicely in the water, hold its course and free us up for other things, such as making small sail adjustments, um, moving things around the boat, maybe getting food down below, or maybe even one of us having a snooze and the other one sitting watch. Um, in driving rain and things like that, it's sometimes good to let the autopilot get wet. You know, we'll, we'll stay nice and dry, thank you, down below. Um, I mean, we keep a watch, don't get me wrong. But the idea is, let the autopilot do a lot of the work for you, and it does a lot of the work for you. But if you get into hairy sailing conditions, you're going to have to stand at the wheel and turn the autopilot off, because for conditions like that, it's not really the answer. But on the whole, do I recommend it? Yeah, why not? It was straightforward to fit, didn't require too much hacking around in the boat, and um, it works. So, And it's fairly cost effective as far as autopilots go. So yeah, I'll give it a thumbs up for the Ray Marine. You know, thank you Uncle Ray, your little thing works just nicely.